Hi everybody and welcome back to my channel. If you have been here before and if you're new, hello, my name's Mary Margaret. I'm so glad that you found my video. Today I am going to do the mid-year freak out tag for books, which I have always wanted to film but never have done. And this is probably gonna be very chaotic because it has been a chaotic year in every respect, but also in terms of reading, maybe especially in terms of reading. And I feel like my thoughts are going to go all over the place, but I'm not going to keep rambling about how the video is going to be. Instead, I'm going to just go ahead and start talking about books, right? That's why you're here. That's why I'm here. So let's get started. I have all of the questions on my computer down below, so I'm looking down to read those, but I've got my stack of books because I read the questions beforehand just to make sure I actually had the books on hand that I wanted to discuss. So the first question is, best book you've read so far in 2021? Well, actually, these aren't really questions. These are more like, explain the best book you've read so far in 2021. So I misled you, my apologies. But the best book I think that I have read so far in 2021, I don't really know if I could pinpoint what the best one was. I think... One of my favorites so far probably would be Laura, which I finished two months ago. And that is by Vera Kaspari. I've talked about it before in a few of my videos this year. And yeah, I kind of knew I was going to like this a lot because I love the movie and I really enjoyed it. So this was quite good. I do have one other book that I forgot to grab. So I'm gonna go get that and I will mention that in just a second. And the book that I read that was also probably my favorite thus far this year is this one that came out in, I believe, February. It is Let Me Tell You What I Mean by Joan Didion. If you are new to this channel, you may not know that I am a huge fan of Joan Didion. I pretty much love everything that I've read of hers, and so no surprise here that I loved this one. These are some previously unpublished essays or essays that I just haven't seen in any of her other compilations that they decided to put here into one kind of chronological sort of format in a book. And I think they're unpublished, but I just don't want to say for sure because I can't remember. But I really, really loved this. I think pretty much every single essay was one of my favorites I've read of hers. And so that's saying a lot. So this is the other book I would say is probably the best one I've read in 2021. The second prompt is best sequel you've read so far in 2021. And unless I'm missing something, I looked through all the books I've read this year and I don't think I read any sequels this year. I read a sequel last year, but uh, that doesn't obviously fit the prompt, so I can't really answer that question, so I'm just gonna move right along. The third prompt is new release you haven't read yet, but want to. And I actually have three books for this, and I'm so excited to read these books because I feel like they are such important books to read. So I'm really excited to talk about them today with you because hopefully you will be interested as well. And even if you're not interested, you know, I just want to talk about them. So the first book is called A Church Called Tove. I think that's how you pronounce it. This is by Scott McKnight and Laura Berenger. It says, forming a goodness culture that resists abuses of power and promotes healing. So it's talking obviously about abuse in the church and abuses of power and how churches obviously shouldn't have those things, but they do, and how we can sort of work to create and cultivate churches that actually promote healing and help those people who have suffered in churches and outside of churches, of course, as well. And this is a very needed text, and I really love that it's written from a woman and a man's perspective because I feel like it really helps sort of um, provide two different really important perspectives that can really give us better ideas in terms of what we can actually do to improve what is a very problematic state of many different churches across the country, across the world. And so I haven't read anything else about this. I just have heard wonderful things. The next book I am super thrilled to read and I am excited to read even though it's going to also be difficult to read is The Making of Biblical Womanhood. This one is by Beth Allison Barr. And can we just take a moment to appreciate this gorgeous cover? As an art historian, I absolutely love that this cover is so... It's so traditional but also very modern so I really appreciate that that's not why I but that that's not why I bought the book but I just wanted to take a moment to appreciate it but 
from what I gather, this book is really all about how womanhood and what is conceived of as being a biblical kind of woman has been kind of created and perpetuated in ways that the Bible do not explicitly actually state. So she explains where all of that came from and what the Bible really does say about what it really means to be a woman who follows biblical truths. That's kind of my understanding, but again, I need to actually read it to sort of talk about it a bit more, but, and I should have mentioned this before, but I am a Christian, and so I do really try to add a lot of different texts about Christian topics and issues that need to be better understood and that need to be discussed. And this is a very, very important one and one that is, of course, very near and dear to my heart. And I will definitely update you on my thoughts about this because I have a feeling that I'm gonna have quite a lot. So um, I've also heard such fabulous things about this book. The last new release that I am very excited to read is this one. It's called It's Not Your Turn by Heather Thompson Day. And I found her on Twitter. I love her Twitter page and she posts so many wonderful thoughts and very like thought-provoking things and basically I found this book through Twitter because of that and it says what to do while you're waiting for your breakthrough and I think we've all been in those points in our lives where it feels like we're at this red light and everyone else is getting green lights to go in different directions whether that's a new job whether they're getting married or they're getting to buy a house or they have you know even if it's just getting a pet you know something that you really want but you can't have because of where you are in your life. And I think we all struggle, especially with social media, with being content with where we are and not having those things. And it's really easy to start resenting other people for their good fortune or for whatever it is that they have that we want, instead of actually being happy for them the way that we should be, especially if they are our friends or just people we care about that we should be happy for. And so the idea about or behind this book really from what I understand is that it's really talking about how to embrace where you are and not to be bitter towards people who have those things that you would like to have and to understand that not everyone's life kind of has the same trajectory and we all have different stages of life that we go through at different paces and some people will have some things and some people won't ever have those things. and. I think all of those different things are so important and I just am really excited to read it because of that. And this author is also Christian, so this is from a Christian perspective, but I am just very ready for this and I have a feeling it's going to be very important, especially since we're all kind of coming out of this past year of basically spending way more time on social media than we ever have because we've been cooped up inside largely. And so I think having a perspective about not comparing our lives with others and how we can kind of achieve that is very, very important. And I will, of course, update you on my thoughts on this once I read it as well. Okay, the next prompt is most anticipated release for the second half of the year. Now, I could have looked this up, um, but I don't really know exactly when this book comes out, but there's this book that is coming out in, I think, think October that's called Lake's Edge and it's very fantasy and very like dark which is not usually something I'm very interested in and I'm going to be completely honest a large part of the reason I'm really interested in it is the cover for the book and I actually can't even think of the author's name at this point but I will try to put it on the screen for you I even follow her on Instagram and I can't remember the name off the top of my head right now which is just sad but that's probably the book I'm most excited for later this year, which is very interesting because I usually don't read that kind of book very often, but the plot sounds interesting and like I said, the cover is gorgeous. So um, Lake's Edge is probably my answer for an anticipated release later this year, but I, I know there were other ones, but that's kind of just the one that came to mind. So I figured, okay, that's clearly the one I'm most interested in if I remembered it, but I'm sorry I couldn't remember the author's name. You should look into it if you haven't heard of it because I don't think it's as popular of a release, but it looks like it's going to be really cool. So yes. The next prompt is biggest disappointment. I didn't even have to think about this because even though I've read other books this year that I rated lower if you look at my Goodreads, this book is the one that disappointed me the most because my expectations for it were so high. And that book is... She-Wolves. 
I read so many positive reviews on Goodreads. I had watched part of the documentary that you can watch that's of the same name. And I think Helen Castor, the author of it, seems like such a brilliant historian and writer and all of these things. So I went into this expecting just to be enthralled and to find like my new favorite history book. Um, this is The Women Who Ruled England Before Elizabeth is what it's all about. So basically kind of the women who made Elizabeth I able to do what she did in some way. So for example, we looked at Eleanor of Aquitaine for a long time and Isabella. We looked at Matilda, which there are a lot of Matildas around the time that this Matilda was ruling. So that got really confusing. And then Margaret. Um, so based on the premise of the book, I thought this was just going to be incredible. And I was so excited to read it, but I was just wildly <laughs> disappointed by this book. The problem I had is that A, I think I made a mistake in the sense that I probably shouldn't have listened to this on an audiobook. But the reason I did this is because at the time I started this book, I was in grad school, which I'm still in grad school. I'm just on break right now. And I was just like, okay, if I'm going to read a heavy historical text, I want to read it in such a way that it's going to make sure I actually will finish it because I have a better track record with audiobooks with that sort of thing than reading the physical book because it just you can get very, very lost in something like this with so many different names, historical dates, and then all of this stuff going on. It, it can get very chaotic. And the audiobook, the narrator was fabulous and so easy to listen to. I loved the narrator for it. But it just got so confusing and there were a lot of assumptions made about things that the author thought, oh, well, that, that should be something you just know. Which maybe if you are from England, you might know that or even the United Kingdom. But as an American, it's kind of like, even as someone who is very, very interested in British history and looks into all things English, all things Scottish, like all of that different area. I love that sort of thing. I was getting very, very confused and I felt like things were told in such a way that it was just very, very difficult to keep track of what was going on and who she was talking about. And for what came across as a very feminist perspective, which I'm all for, I'm a feminist, love that, that's great. She kept comparing all of these women to men. And I'm like comparing men to women and their successes and failures like that to me, if you're trying to focus on the women and their history, it bothers me that you're constantly comparing them to men. We don't need that comparison, like spend the time actually talking about the women and let us draw our own conclusions without you kind of doing it for us. So that really bothered me. The other thing I had a lot of trouble with is that a lot of this had to do with a lot of like assumptions made about the women because a lot of these sort of anecdotes I would call because they're not historical fact were based on written accounts of people who were not really the most outstanding historians of the time or anything like that. It's more like it came across to me as like gossip that could have been true. None of this was to me in a convincing way told as being fact. It seemed very false to me in a lot of ways. And I'm like, if we don't know for sure that this is the case, I don't want to hear your theories. I don't want to hear your hypotheses. Like, I want to know if it's true or not. If not, why are we listening to hearsay? Because that's really something that I have problems with. And clearly, it's not like she needed it to make the book longer. But at the same time, the book is long because she included so much hearsay. So maybe because I'm clueless about this time period, in a lot of ways, I don't know that these people are actually trustworthy. But to me, it came across as gossip. And it wasn't helpful. And it actually made me not like these people. And I'm not a judgmental type of person who doesn't like someone because they're not a nice person in history, especially if they're a ruler of some kind, because one of my favorite biographies is one of Catherine the Great, who is a very problematic person. But it depends on how they're told. Like the way that Helen Castor talked about these people made me dislike rather than like or want to root for these people because they were just kind of very unlikably portrayed. So I'm trying not to be scared off of reading about these people anymore. Like Eleanor of Aquitaine originally was very interesting to me, but 
the way that she's explained in this book makes me never want to look into her and I'm like well I should give her another chance it's probably just this book just didn't work for me so anyway I've gone off long enough about this book but I am really sad to say goodbye to it because I am going to either sell or donate this and it's such a gorgeous book like this is part of a gorgeous painting and it just looks amazing but I just never I'm never going to pick it up again so biggest disappointment in case you couldn't tell so the next prompt is biggest surprise and I think for that I have to um talk about this book that I read that was probably just something that I just was not expecting in any way shape or form and that is A Tree Grows in Brooklyn by Betty Smith. I have heard of this book for a very very long time because I grew up in a house where both of my parents read all the time and they used to read even more when they had a little more time and so I knew that my mom had read this growing up and she really liked it a lot and all of that so I had heard her talking about it but I've heard other people discuss it as well because it's just one of those books that people just talk about for decades and decades after it has been written but I had this kind of picture in my mind of what I was expecting the book to be and this just was absolutely nothing <laughs> absolutely nothing like that at all so I was just like what I don't even know what's happening right now and I just, the only thing I think I guessed correctly about this book on my initial sort of assumptions about what it was going to be like is that it takes place in Brooklyn. That's literally it. I was just absolutely flabbergasted and I buddy read this with Julia from Shakespeare and such around like January I think and we were messaging each other about it and I was like did you just finish this chapter? Oftentimes it was more like she was asking me have you read this chapter because I'm always behind on buddy reads but I was like, no, not yet. And she's like, buckle up. It's something else. Um, she didn't say it like that because, you know, that was a weird way to say that. But basically she was like, prepare yourself. This is something crazy. And this is something very out there. And it really was. So we were just kind of messaging each other, what? <laughs> All the time we were reading this book. So this is the one that was definitely the biggest surprise to me. Um, it's not my new favorite book or anything like that, but I do think it surprised me in good ways as well as negative ways. It was a very interesting experience, in case you hadn't gathered that from my <laughs> very uh, interesting description of it. The next prompt is favorite new author, either a debut or new to you. And for this one, I don't have a physical copy of the book because I listened to this on audiobook, but it was a book by Nella Larson called Passing. And that was probably the first book that I read this year that I just couldn't put down because it was written in such a compelling way that I just couldn't stop. And that's pretty rare with audiobooks that that happens for me because I usually need to take a break. But I found myself trying to find things to do that would allow me to keep listening to the audiobook and justify it. Um, but Nella Larson, I feel like her writing style is so wonderful because it sort of sounds like you are reading a movie, which what I'm trying to say by that is basically it's sort of like if you were to read a film that was made in like the 1940s and it's very high contrast there are a lot of shadows there's a lot of sort of smoke and like mirrors and things like that and it's super cinematic that's how her writing read to me and I know I was listening to it but the narrator for this audiobook was not very good also so the fact that I was still wanting to listen to it should say something but I just was absolutely hooked into the story and the ending I remember listening to and I was just like that's it that's it we don't know anything else and I was just again like I used the word before flabbergasted but that's how I felt about this particular book so what I'm trying to say is Nella Larson is my new I think favorite author that I found this year because I definitely want to find more of her work I think primarily aside from passing she wrote a lot of short stories but I really need to research more because I, as I said she's new to me so I honestly like I've heard her name before but I had never read anything about her really up until this year and I really want to change that. So Passing is 
really difficult to explain because you don't want to give any spoilers and that's very difficult to do unless you don't really talk about the plot. So two old friends meet for the first time in a very, very long time. And you can tell right from the start that things are very strained and you don't really know why, but it kind of slowly starts to unravel why they used to be friends, why they weren't really friends anymore. One of the most important elements of the book has to do with conversations about racism and how some people are treated based on racist beliefs and opinions and really just systemic racism. And it does so in such a way that it makes you incredibly, I don't really know how to explain it, but it, it really does make you incredibly angry and you should be angry but it does so in a way that it sort of builds as the story progresses so that by the time you get to the very last part of it it's just kind of astonishing um so yes i'm not explaining this very well at all what i would like to impress upon you though is that you should read this book fantastic the author was incredibly gifted and i definitely look forward to reading more of her work soon okay the next prompt is newest fictional crush <laughs> and those are very rare for me i don't really form crushes on fictional characters unless they're extra special people but i guess i would say the closest i could come to that would be in this book that i started last month that i really need to just sit down to finish because it wouldn't take me very long and it is mary stewart's thunder on the right it's one of the few books of hers that i have not read if you're new to my channel, you won't have heard me rave about how amazing Mary Stewart is, but I love her books. Pretty much all of the ones I've ever read, I just adore. And this one is basically, she kind of has this thing that she does in her books where she focuses on one element. And by that, I mean, for example, one of her books, she focuses on theater. And then another book, she focuses more on, you know, poetry, for example. I mean, just different things like that. But this one is definitely music, which is really cool. So the different chapter names have different sort of musical features to them. And so I guess I would say I really do like the love interest in this one so far, because he's kind of like this composer and musician who's very like sensitive and very broody, which in theory is really cool. <laughs> pun on theory, but in real life might not be so appealing to be with a brooding composer. But in the book, it's very interesting to read. So I guess that would kind of fit. But at the same time, I don't know, I haven't finished the book yet. So I don't know. That's the closest I could come to that though. For what it's worth. The next prompt is newest favorite character. And I have to bring back this tree grows in Brooklyn. And the reason for that is because the very best part about this book, Julia and I both agreed, is that Francie, the main character, who's pictured here on the front, is just one of the best and sweetest characters that I have ever encountered in a book. And I just love it. So, you know, she's just the sweetest character and she loves reading and she talks about that a lot. But the way that she sees the world is just so wonderful because she has such wonderment and such a sort of perspective on the world that's so magical and so impressive considering how hard her life was. The way that she viewed the world with such charitable eyes, it just is such a lovely thing to read. So Francie for sure. The next prompt is a book that made you cry. Well, books do not often make me cry. It really has to be quite, quite, sad to make me cry. And I think the only reason this one didn't make me cry is because I knew what was going to happen because it was that sad. It's so, so, so sad. And that is Love Story by Eric Segal, I think is how you say his name. But this book is one that I had decided to read this because I had my aunt's copy of it. And that is this one right here. And I just love that it has like the movie cover on it. And it's, it's really, really short, very, very easy to read. And um, 
I really did enjoy it, but it is just one of those that just makes you so sad at the end. So I think that love story is just one of the most heartbreaking things that I have read in a very long time. And I think the simplicity of it is what makes it so sad in many ways, but it's simple in a very complex way. So I hate to say it's simple, um, but I would highly recommend it if you haven't read it before, if you're kind of into that sort of thing where it's like a very sweet love story, but at the same time, very sad. Uh, I really, really liked this quite a lot. And the only thing I have to say that's negative about it is that it does have some very outdated things in it that are very not okay to include in a book. Some of them are stereotypes that I really just was not happy about. Aside from that, I really did love this and I I just think it was very moving and, you know, really flew through this and loved it. I look forward to watching the movie in the near future because I do really like Ryan O'Neill. I grew up watching What's Up Doc with him in it. Uh, I think the only thing I didn't like in this is the part where it says love means not ever having to say you're sorry which is made fun of in What's Up Doc. And the reason I hate that is because I think if anything, the people you love are the ones you should apologize to the most, not vice versa. But that's my humble opinion. Other than that, I did really enjoy this book and it didn't make me cry, but it brought me pretty darn close, so. Okay, the next one is a book that made you happy. And for that one, I am going to mention a book that I just started reading last night because I was messaging Kara from Wild Book Garden. I talk about her all the time because she's one of my best friends and she's just amazing and I love her. And uh, she's one of the main reasons I got on booktube in the first place for the second time. Very confusing and it's a long story. But she texted me yesterday and we were just talking about what we were reading and I was just saying, you know, I'm kind of in a, not a rut because I'm still reading, but I'm not really thoroughly engaged in anything I'm reading. And so basically we got to the point where we were talking about how rereading books can really reignite your interest in reading and can help you a lot with that. And so I pulled out one of these books that I have been kind of eyeing and wanting to reread for the past few months. And it is a, from a series that I talk about all the time because it's one of my absolute favorites. And that is Strong Poison from the Lord Peter Whimsey Mystery series. And this is by Dorothy L. Sayers. And this cover is absolutely hideous. I hate this cover. But at the same time, I want all of my books in the series to be the same because these are the copies I read when I first read the series. So even though this one in particular is hideous, it's what I like for nostalgic reasons. Anyhow, that being said, this book is just one of my absolute favorites of all time. I'm already flying through it even though I've got homework to do and other things I need to get done because I just love Lord Peter Whimsey so very much and I love Harriet Thane who's the other main character in this book so so much. And the premise of this story, if you haven't heard me talk about it before, is that Harriet Vane is a character who is a mystery novel writer who was basically romantically involved with this other author, this other writer, and he gets killed, murdered by arsenic poisoning. Basically, they don't really know what happened, but she's been accused of his murder. And so the story starts with the courtroom, the trial that's going on, and it sets up the story by telling exactly how her former partner had died and talking about why they think Harriet is the one who did it. Lord Peter Whimsey, who previously to this book in the series has solved a bunch of mysteries already, goes into this situation. He's in the courtroom and he says, there is no way she did this. Like, she's innocent. There's no way. I don't think she did this. So he decides he's going to solve this mystery and find out who actually did it. And so the story kind of continues from there. And so he and Harriet meet and things sort of happen. And their conversations are just top notch. They're absolutely incredible. I absolutely love them. They're so wonderful. And Lord Peter Whimsey is one of my favorite fictional characters of all time. I absolutely adore him. So it was definitely a good idea to start rereading a book. Thank you, Kara, for giving me the idea and the green light to do that. And I would say this is the book that's made me the happiest this year so far. Aside 
from the Joan Didion book because Joan Didion makes me happy even though she often makes me sad as well because it's Joan Didion. Just wanted to say that. And the next prompt is most beautiful book you've bought so far this year or received. So I bought quite a few books this year um, and by that I mean I've bought more than I planned to which I was not planning to buy any books this year but I would bring this one back out because I think this one is gorgeous. It's so pretty that I wasn't even paying attention to it when I picked it up and just hit myself in the face with it. So that's one of them. The other one I think is really gorgeous is this one that my dad gave to me. It's Georgette Heyer, one of her mysteries called They Found Him Dead. I think this painting is just gorgeous and I absolutely love the color of this cover as well. This is a book I definitely want to read soon. And then this other book I purchased for myself on Sunday and I'm so excited to have this. I've been kind of eyeing this book for probably three, four years now and it is Joan Didion, her collected nonfiction. So if you can see between these little bars here we've got a photograph of Joan Didion and it's one of these gorgeous Everyman Library Edition or Everyman's Library Edition and it has a cloth bookmark. Inside it has Slouching Towards Bethlehem, which I have not yet read and I really want to. The White Album, which I read last year. Salvador, Miami, After Henry, Political Fictions, which I'm really excited to read. Where I Was From, which I'm also very, very excited to read. Notes to Miami, and then of course, Acknowledgements. And the text inside is just gorgeous. I just love how this looks. And I used to check out these editions from our library all the time. So even if I take like the jacket off, it's just very nostalgic for me to see this gorgeous spine. And it was on half off at the store where I got it. So I was very, very happy about that. So I think that's probably one of the other most beautiful books that I have gotten this year. And the very last prompt is what books do you need to read by the end of the year. Well, I've talked about these several times on my channel. The first one I need to finish reading, I'm looking at a stack over here, is War and Peace, which I'm slowly but surely making my way through. My goal was to read it in this year, so I wasn't planning to read it in a month or two, so no surprises there that I haven't finished that one yet. I'm sorry I keep playing with my hair, it keeps falling in my eyes, and I'm like, I cannot deal with hair in my eyes. Um, but then the other book I really want to finish by the end of this year is East of Eden, which I've talked about before. I just keep kind of shuddering to a stop because it's just that disturbing uh, to me anyway. So I'll be making really good progress, kind of just going along in the book. And then I get to this part and I'm like, ah, what is happening? So I just pause and then I'll go pick up a Jane Austen because, you know, a girl needs a break sometimes. Those are two really big books that I want to finish. And then I really would like to read some more Shakespeare by the end of this year. So those aren't technically books, but in my head, I kind of catalog them as books. So whatever. Um, I'm trying to read at least six plays of his this year. I've only finished one play this year so far, but I've made good progress on a second one. Okay, I think my camera moved because it officially stopped recording on me for the second time in this process. But I was just talking about how much I wanted to read some more Shakespeare plays by the end of this year, in addition to The Fairy Queen, which is another one I would really like to finish by the end of this year, and then some more Jane Austen books. And I talked a lot more about that, but the camera was not recording and I didn't realize it. So I think I probably should just let it be a shorter answer than I had it originally and kind of close this video because that was the last prompt. But thank you so very much for watching. I'm so glad that you stuck around to finish this video. And thank you all so much for your kind comments and for interacting with me. That's why I love to do this. And I just saw that I almost have 200 subscribers, which I just can't even believe. I don't even understand how that's possible. I know that's probably a small number to a lot of you, but to me it just is not something I ever expected to have happen. So thank you very much for all of you being such wonderful parts of my community. It just makes me so happy. And I did want to share with you, I actually opened a blog recently. I have two posts on there so far and I'm about to write my third one. And it's basically just a place for me to share ramblings about all sorts of different things. So whether that's opera or it's about my new favorite musical or a film I watched or a book that I just didn't discuss on my channel for whatever reason. And it's just a blog called MM's Musings, like my channel, and I will link it down below if you're interested in taking a look. And I will talk to you very soon, I hope. Have a wonderful week.